I like I'd be so like Mercedes they all get those performance chronos it's basically a like a matte pilot with the team colors on it super cool watch uh I would much rather have that IWC than like hey you're a crew member on uh, Red Bull here's your 45 mil connected watch you're like oh man maybe I will take that Mercedes contract welcome to the show you have missed you've missed the assassination of I was planning Kevin's death, frankly, either deliberately with him here. or with him here. <laughs> which, you know, in front gives, of him, the arrogance um, of it all. <laughs> <laughs> it does at least give him a head start. It's like one of those, I've yeah, never seen the Hunger me. Games, but is that not kind of the plot? No, or is that no, no like it's so man? far from that. <laughs> is it not? All right, <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I thought it was about killing people, you know, kids or something. You know, I think like, it's Battle Royale. Pretty sure Battle most Royale movies are about from. killing people. That doesn't really narrow it down. All right, okay. Is it Running Man? Is that the one where somebody has to roll? Is that a bit more? I'm just now listing <laughs> films that I've never seen. <laughs> anyway, never seen the I think maybe Manhunt is the most recent one, perhaps. I'm not sure. Is that the Sylvester Stallone one? Running man. Oh, the Arnold. No, that's Arnold. No. Schwarzenegger. No, Arnold. Yes, it is. Yes, I have. Seen I it. think I you need seen. to have a screening. Okay. Okay, a screening. We'll have one of those shared things so we can all watch it together, and then as soon as we're finished, like when you, when any Scotsman went to see Highland, not Highlander, went to see. Uh, oh dear, what a mental breakdown here. <laughs> what was the What was the Mel Gibson film? Braveheart. 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 When Scottish, we went to see Braveheart, they immediately got really kind of passive aggressive to everyone that wasn't Scottish. We'd all go and see Running Man and then want to hunt down Kevin for his watch collection. You might want to do that. Now watch the, sh- watch the movie and you'll see. Uh, right. Let's talk about some um, business of watches. Geneva Watch Days is on its way. Ariel, you're in Geneva. Yes. One of the stories of the week on Watch Pro, this particular coverage, is Chanel buying a stake in MB and F. I suspect this might get a bit of a chatter at the show itself. MB and F being one of, I think, do they call themselves a founder member of Geneva Watch Days or just a kind of main sponsor? But they were certainly one of the folk responsible for setting up. And Max, having said he'd never sell to anyone, has said he'll sell 25 or sold 25% to Chanel. Is this important or does it not actually matter? I don't know if it matters nowadays. Maybe it would have mattered in the first several years of MB Enough. You know, you're talking about a company that's, um, you know, 20 years old, essentially. And for them to have endured all that they did, set up international distribution and stuff like that, they did it alone, they did it independent, and ostensibly more or less how... Max Booster wanted it. You're absolutely right that he's made a lot of statements over the years that contradict this type of move. But we've had several years of a lot of uncertainty. We have him and his team who want stability. Um, the news was very opaque in terms of what it actually meant. I spoke personally with her team a little bit. And I was like, guys, everyone's basically just copying and pasting this press release without discussing what actually happened and why. He's like, well, they're really sensitive about that. I'm like, yeah, but we're not going to write about it, just speculate. We don't know the details. And he understands that. I think there's lots of hints where he talks about this ensures the sustainability or an ongoing operation and whatever. I mean, that's unclear why that is the fact. We do know that Chanel has a stake in a couple of brands like that. And I think the big question is, what does Chanel get out of this? Right? Like, we understand what MB&F gets out of this. What does Chanel get out of it? And I think that's really some of the biggest unanswered questions. I mean, MBNF isn't a factory. They can't, you know, produce parts for Chanel. There's expertise. They can help Chanel do certain things. For me, that's really the question is what exactly does Chanel want out of it right now? And if Chanel doesn't want anything, then why uh, was MBNF compelled uh, to give such a big stake? I think another big part of it is with that stake came a bunch of money. So I think they took a bunch of cash And that's now in reserves and there for whatever reason. I think some of the the moral of the story is that even a company like MB&F probably doesn't have the cash flow that people might imagine. And they need that because there's a lot of periods of uncertainty. So what I find happens is these types of deals occur when brands believe they could experience one or two or three or four more years 
of a lack of consistent income, they need to have sort of a, a, a monetary backing to make sure that they, uh, they don't run into problems if they have issues with cash flow. So that's my guess. But again, there's so many details that we don't know. Um, I, I, I don't want to guess and speculate like everyone else has. Oh, well, we like to guess and speculate, so we'll just Okay, that. you guys can do uh, it. What, so Chanel now own a share of Bell & Ross, Kinesi, MB&F. Well, that, the Bell & Ross isn't new. That that was almost yeah, that's, that was a long time ago. Yeah, 90s or something. Uh, eh, do they own a bit of FP Jure? Um, I don't know. I think that might have been, maybe. I know that there's Romain Gautier, there's part of that. Uh, Roman, I think that's it. I think they were a bit of FP show and Roman Gauthier. So they're kind of, are they, they do seem to be just quietly building themselves a little, uh, little watch empire as well as producing their own watches. Well, Ripley, for, for uh, many years, Chanel was working through APRP that is now owned by Audemars Piguet for a lot of their high complications, their tourbillons and stuff like that was made through them. Um, that didn't work out amazingly for Chanel. One of the reasons was some of those watches were flops. There were some really crazy ones that weird J12 that you, you have the crown that comes through the, <laughs> through the, through the dial. Uh, there was that weird one. There were some of the turbines. They're all cool watches, but they didn't do that well. So I think Chanel has been in a strange position where getting super high-end uh, stuff made literally requires them having a stake in these suppliers and things like that. But but again, I don't know that Chanel's empire of watches depends on $50,000 and up timepieces. Ripley, Kevin, Will, any thoughts on this, what it says about uh, MBF? Currently, does, do we know if this includes the MAD thing or is that a separate, like these non-MBNF MAD watches that are selling thousands of, is that a separate company? One of the many questions we don't have answers to. I th- I, I'm guessing it's part of it, but I don't think that's what Chanel was interested in. But maybe. I, I, I don't know. I think that there's one company, corporate you know, entity that owns MBNF, and they paid for 20, I think it was a 25% stake. And again, this was, this was probably in exchange for a big lump of cash. Big lump of cash. Will, how much would you have paid for 25% of MBNF? Uh, I'm not, I'm struggling to see what, Chanel's interest is other than trying to, I suppose, buy some further credibility um, in in the watch game. Um, I'm not sure in terms of the economics of it. As Ariel said, there's lots of kind of unanswered questions um, around it. But um, I don't know. I also have a soft spot for the J12 um, Chanel watch in, in a strange way. In, in black, I quite I quite like it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, MBNF is 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 seen as being quite a cool brand i think so perhaps they're just buying some further street cred um i'm not sure ripley a man known for his street cred uh all the street cred um i i don't know i could see this being a good thing for you know if you look at the brands that chanel kind of partners with their or owns a stake in they're very much in the opposite offering of chanel not necessarily from a price point perspective but from the type of watches and the type of ones they speak to. Chanel is a big fashion brand outside of just watches. They produce a bunch of other stuff. And um, the average person who buys a Chanel watch isn't necessarily like a dyed in the wool watch enthusiast. Uh, If you look at a brand like MBNF, no one buys one of those, not even just random rich dudes, unless they're like pretty deep into watches. Otherwise they just have like a Rolex or a Patek or like a Richard Mille or something like that. So I could see this being a way to, on one hand, financially hedge their bets. So if, Fashion watches are booming and they can just sell a bunch of J12s all day long. Great. Um, and if the things are kind of shifting the other way towards these high value enthusiast driven pieces, that's how you get into sort of the other ones um, like MBNF. Now, obviously, Kinesi is a movement manufacturer, but MBNF also does cool stuff via their network of max's friends in the greater category of the term. And so this might be an interesting way for Chanel to uh, sort of tap that network um with a pre-existing partner that has these relationships rather than broaching all of these random individual companies that some of them are basically single artisans or workshops um to do the cool stuff for them so i could easily see whether they're after some of the little technical things mbnf does maybe some of their um just network as far as the suppliers either on the art or movement side but I could see this being something where it does benefit uh, J- Chanel's own product catalog um, outside of just, you know, using the investment as a monetary tool. 
Uh, Kevin, ever been tempted to buy an MBNF as this big independent brand and would its ownership now clearly not buy a big independent brand ever do anything to put you off? Like, does this move them into a different category? They're no longer the funky indie brand, breaking all the rules, doing all the things because they're owned by a great big French empire? No, I don't think so. I mean, to be, to be fair, I do have an NBNF. It's, it's the mad one, so technically it's the baby brother of an NBNF. But, um, you know, it, it, it gives Max, the, as Ariel said, the flexibility and security going forward to, to pay his staff. He might have a, um, a new um, a refit of the, of the Geneva store. So he obviously needs money to pay for this and obviously perhaps opening up their boutiques further around the world. Um, obviously, I think out of the two, MBNF got a better deal. Um, obviously, he's got the backing and the security that uh, Chanel can provide. Chanel, it's a question of what does Chanel get out of this? And to me, there's, there's nothing obvious. Uh, he did touch on, you know, getting into the um, artisans and perhaps there will be, you know, a, a special one off MBNF. Um, to know what coming down the line, you know, for for charity. But apart from that, there isn't anything I can see. Um, to know, get out of it. Um, and the other question is, of course, sorry to bring it back to Bremont. What does that? <laughs> who? Which which brand is is worth more, Bremont or MBNF? We just don't know. Which is an no, interesting no, I think we question. Do know. I think, we do know. I, think we do. I think I think I think it's very clear as to which brand is fundamentally worth more. One may be costing more, yeah, but one which one's actually more, yeah. worth more? Yeah, I, I did actually dig slightly further into the Bremen accounts, and oh. I was extremely surprised, if that's a an appropriate phrase, at how little their sales in Europe and the USA are. You know, it it was. You know, it wasn't breaking six figures in some cases, and just how reliant they wow. still are on the UK for sales. And right now, I would not be want to be reliant on the UK for supporting my enormously costly watch brand uh, for anything. I think their European sales were in, you know, six hundred thousand pounds worth. I mean, that's not a lot of watches for what's probably quite a lot of investment trying to sell them. Uh, over there and obviously they, they've had a go at breaking the states several times right. so you know they're not the Beatles there may be more status quo they just need to focus on 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 growing their hair long and staying in the UK rather than trying to break America uh, yeah for sure we with all, with hair long and you know with Stratton Castell that he saw playing guitar yeah, I can see him doing that exactly the telecaster of watch brands. Yes. Anyway, right, or, or the status quo of watch brands. Uh, let's talk about a watch brand that's definitely not status quo. Ripley, you reviewed this, the Urwork EMC SR71 watch. This feels, first of all, like an enormously short name for an Urwork, like enormously manageable, so we're grateful for that. Uh, but tell us about this in particular, SR71, what's the relevance of the... So uh, SR71 is a reference to the Lockheed, uh, Lockheed XR71 Blackbird aircraft. Uh, spy plane, uh, it, it still holds the record for like the fastest manned aircraft uh, or air-breathing aircraft. I guess you could have a rocket or something to go faster. Um, anyway, what this is, is this is the uh, the mod, the EMC series. So this isn't a new watch uh, from a movement perspective. This is the one where it has a built into mechanical movement, hand wound, but it's got a built in generator with a crank. So you crank it up and it's basically got a little time grapher in there that w works with an optical viewing of the balance rather than a sensor for the, you know, a, a sonic sensor. Uh, but it'll tell you how much your your watch is running off and then allow you to make fine adjustments to tailor in the timekeeping. So super cool watch. I've, I like these. They kind of exist in a few configurations. This is sort of the original one that first debuted. Then they've got kind of the time uh, hunter models that have more of a larger time telling display. Um, the cool part about this one is the hand crank for it is made out of a special titanium alloy um, that was cut from the fusel fuselage of an actual SR-71 aircraft. Uh, so it's not regular titanium, like grade two, grade five. It's got a bunch of other bits in it um, and has a very long chemical name and its exact composition is 
a bit murky, uh, but they basically remelted down that metal and turned it into the crank for this. Um, and then the rest of the watch sort of features a much more uh, kind of instrument sp- inspired aesthetic with the yellow accents on the movement, blacked out case, kind of that Velcro style flight strap. Um, and one of the, this was done in collaboration, uh, with dreamland, which is sort of this like aviation inspired kind of, uh, lifestyle brand. And one of the guys behind it, uh, Jason is someone that Ariel and I uh, both know. So it was, I was surprised to see his name on the press release, but I think it's a super cool watch and, um, might be aesthetically speaking, my favorite one of the EMC series. Yeah, I think aesthetically speaking, it's probably one of my favorite Uroworks. I love the look of this. Is it seemed to be not being terribly well received for the looks, but I think it's I think it's awesome. Anybody else thoughts? Yeah, let's let's not forget that the EMC was never exactly heralded in as the beauty watch of the century. Um, it was always sort of a weird weird one out, and it took. I mean, imagine explaining it to someone. Yeah, it's a watch, but I crank it to see if it's accurate. And if it's not, I do something about it. Like it's, there's a lot, a lot of things to explain about this to the lay person. Um, Ripley's correct that um, uh, a buddy of ours was responsible for this. And I remember seeing a lot of the metal. Um, and it wasn't really that glamorous. It was like chunks of torn off titanium that looked like from like a, like a wreck. Uh, that were sort of like melted down and turned to this. So I can attest this is you know, this is real titanium, ostensibly from, um, you know, I mean there was a lot of there was a lot of mishaps with these these plants, right? So you had to work closely with the team that actually um, you know worked with these in Nevada and stuff like that uh, to get that. Um, it is an interesting take on the Urwork concept. It sort of imagines it as an aviation instrument. So I like the sort of fantasy element there. It's sort of like what if the pilots of this wore this high tech of high tech thing? So for me, this is this is where we're going into the world of I wouldn't call it science fiction, but historical fiction, where we look longingly and nostalgically upon something and say, "I want these tools to have been part of it." I think the actual SR seventy one pilots were wearing um, Accutrons, actually. Yeah, the Accutron uh, astronauts. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I think the relevance there is that while those were, you know, electronic watches that were quite accurate, this is a mechanical watch, but has an electronic component to help keep it accurate. So there's sort of like these nuanced, you know, um, relationship (laughs) building connections between this watch and the whole thing. Um, But it's sort of like with watches and cars. They don't always really need a, a super good cohesive thing between them but you like cars you like watches it makes sense same thing here you like planes and military history and you like watches and you just sort of wanted to all um go together so I, I i think this is fun this is very much a limited edition that has a cool presentation uh the box that comes in is sort of this cool yellow it's like a yellow pelican that matches the sort of uh, back there so uh a, an interesting limited edition a good collaboration um and I think this stuff is particularly relevant right now because it adds our love of tools, but also sort of this male fantasies that we like to chat about. Um, so in, in that regard, I think this is going to be very successful. Yeah. And I mean, there's really not a lot of them because production's obviously limited by the titanium that could go there. So uh, the, the piece, I believe, is made to celebrate the anniversary of the EMC collection. Uh, so it's been 10 years. So I believe they're doing, you know, 10 of these watches in total. Um, So this isn't going to be a mass market thing. It's kind of a niche offering. But um, from a conceptual standpoint, I kind of like it because in the same way that, you know, the watch where uh, the RJ watch that had the piece of the Titanic or whatever that Bremont with Stephen Hawking's desk. I promise I'm not trying to bring it back to Bremont. Uh, But, (laughs) you know, it is sort of cool when, you know, it's not a precious material, but the material itself is intrinsically rare due to provenance or origin. So it kind of just adds a different layer, which I think is... um, cool while also being free from flagrant airplane branding like many other kind of aviation inspired watches it's like the heat death of the universe eventually everything returns to bremen i uh, okay <laughs> so i i want to add hand cranking of a watch to our our watch design so we've got live laugh love for the back of the case the birthday uh, calendar complication and uh, possibly an equation of time or, or a completely random pulsometer. But I would like our winding mechanism to be uh, hand cranking because I, I think that's the coolest thing about this watch. 
Well, it's not the winding mechanism. It's not the winding mechanism. You wind the watch as a standard watch. What the crank is for is to tar- charge a micro generator. So there's no battery. It charges a micro generator to power the electronically operated uh, optical timing machine that's built in there, which then presents how your deviation on that upper uh, left register there. So it the watch itself entirely mechanical. You got to wind it like normal, but in order to power the electricity, it's like one of those wee little uh, flashlights that you have in the earthquake kit. Or I guess you don't have earthquakes, right? You don't have earthquakes. You the other emergency. Thing. It has its own little built-in witchy machine, which for those that don't know is a is a company that makes um, watch uh, rate result timers. It tells you how accurate they are. So it has like a little mini one built into it. And what we've seen after this are some watches with not this optical uh, sensor, but lights. So we've had mechanical watches have lights in them. Um, HYT did it. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I remember how Panerai does it in their new thing. Yeah, the new one. I don't know if there requires a, a crank. I think you push it. It does the same type of action. Uh, but I don't know if you've had flashlights or very simple things where you just sort of um, – perform some action you either shake it or you crank something you got a few minutes a few minutes or a few seconds of power that's essentially what's going on here i think what we do is we have the hand crank on the watch it's connected to some form of resistance we don't tell anybody what it does but we take the tide button off of the tag hoyer from the last two weeks and just put it on the side and just let everybody assume that somehow the two things are connected Without actually telling them, there's just a hand crank. Who knows what it does? It's part of the secret sauce. Part maybe, of the magic. Maybe this needs to go in our April Fool's thing. We got to put some hand crank in there. I don't know the rest of the idea, but it's got to include a hand crank. Well, you, Rick, do you just love the hand crank because it's like the Panerai lever, but like on steroids and it can rotate and it's like 10 times better? If if Panerai could get the wee clip lock and just enable me to turn it, it would have the same the same impact. Uh, Chuck in the chat is making the suggestion that there's a horseshoe theory between our work and Ublo, which is if you take an amazing indie watchmaking far enough, you eventually end up making it look like a Hublo. So uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting theory, and and there may be some truth of that. Maybe maybe we need to remove Bremen from the heat death of the universe, and everything just devolves into being an Ublo. Uh, Will, you've been astonishingly quiet on this subject. Yeah, um, I was stunned by the uh, the watch. It's absolutely amazing. It's kind of exactly the type of watch that I would design as um, as a young boy or as a teenager. Um, uh, as Ariel said, it completely captures your imagination. And um, I think a, a random and mysterious hand crank on the side of a watch is always a good thing. It could be like, um, I only say this because it's now on Netflix, uh, in the UK anyway, Lost, all of the back episodes have Lost. Um, part of the plot in that is that somebody has to keep, um, I think they have to keep pushing a button or keep turning something. No, the numbers. They have to enter the numbers. Ah, they have to enter the numbers, yes, yeah. So I think if we could somehow get it out there that you have to keep cranking the watch or something absolutely catastrophic will happen, and just see how long that flies. I mean, that's part of it's part of an April Fool thing, perhaps, or just you know, I don't know. Watch people are a bit crazy, so you just see see how long it will go. What if it's like the movie Speed, where if you you have a hand crank and if your power reserve gets below a certain thing, the watch will blow up. Yes, oh, little... or it, or it turns into a new blow. <laughs> transforms, transforms. Well, There's something here, let's... guys. There's some comedy waiting to be uh, released well, here. Let's do that. Let's turn it into a new blow. The uh, see, see what I did there? Look at that. That's just a remarkable segueing. Uh, <laughs> Arrow, you had a hands on the Ublo MP13 Tourbillon by Axis Retrograde Black Carbon Watch, a name not as short as the Urwork. Uh, I think it's priced similarly to the Urwork. We'll find out in a wee moment as I scroll down. But what was this actually like to wear in the flesh? So this is sort of a, I'll call it a 1.5 generation because it was sort of a watch that s- had a similar system. It had the biaxial tourbillon in this place. It used a similar case shape. Um, they've enhanced the dial a little bit. One of the things I, I find interesting about this watch is, is no one ever asked for this. Like, you know what I really want? I want two retrograde hands and a biaxial tourbillon placed there with this shape. Like no one thought to themselves, this is my dream. But now that Ublo built it, you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, there seems to be this department at Hublot which still 
is trying to push the envelope for these high end movements where they do new things. Um, there is a collector base for this. This is this is sort of very very niche for Hublot, but again, it makes it makes the whole company look better that they can do stuff like this. Um, this is a very weird watch in terms of it doesn't sort of follow traditional forms of beauty and stuff like that, but it is cool and elegant. This Texalium material um, is is sort of a it's based on carbon, but it looks a little bit more attractive than sort of the old carbon fiber that. Ublo is obsessed with like at the height of carbon fiber. Ublo was all over. The other companies were as well, and Ublo actually did. This is funny. People don't really give them credit for this. The nicest carbon fiber cases. I don't know if you guys remember when it was like carbon fiber dial, blah 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 blah. But Ublo did a case or a series of cases that were like the most attractive carbon fiber. They wanted to make sure the weave was correct and the pattern and all that stuff. Um, and then they went on to this. So, you know, for those that still have a soft spot for those sort of textured carbon things, this Texalium is um, the spiritual successor, if you will, to sort of carbon fiber. Um, the movement is interesting. You have a retrograde hand for the hours and minutes, which um, is not immediately obvious until you actually watch the, the timepiece operate. That was designed to keep them out of the way of the tourbillon so it didn't block it. Um, as you can see on the case back there, there's <clears throat> a bit of a bubble for this tourbillon that spins in two directions. Um, but this is actually an achievement of downsizing because sort of earlier versions of this watch were just unwearable. Um, so this is definitely wearable. It's big. So um, again, there is there is a collector out there who's for this. Any of us, I think, would be actually proud to wear this. But it's one of those weird ones that I don't think just ends up on a lot of grail lists. Yeah, I'm disappointed in Ubo because now I don't know what I'm going to do with my USB I link that I've got because they've lost it. It's not got a wee USB adapter port in the bottom of this Ublo. So I'm disappointed. Uh, you've let us all down. Uh, Ariel, is it legible? Can you actually tell the time in this watch? Yeah, you have to know what you're looking at. Um, you follow the, the the hand across the hour scale and then you follow it across the minute scale. It's it's not it's not hard to read once you get the, the hang of it. There's a power reserve indicator. Um, Legibility is actually a strong point, and I think that there's a classification of collector out there who's delighted in dials that people can't read unless you explain it to them. And I've seen this happen. So the sort of normal 12-hour <laughs> dial, we understand it. But they love showing people the watch and be like, can you tell me what time it is? And people are just like stumped and befuddled, like, I don't know what I'm looking at. This brings utter joy to certain people. So I'm imagining this um, this playful somewhat mischievous owner wearing this going around being like do you know what time it is and then getting a big kick that you know very few people understand the style that's that's honestly i think one of the selling points is that bubble on the case back like uh, is that like a thing you feel on your wrist not really um it's not as big as some other bubbles that have been in the past i'm thinking about you zenith um also lvmh um a lot of bubbles from that uh, from that company um but no it's it's there but honestly you can have several millimeters of bubble on the back of a watch and uh, oddly you won't feel it because it'll kind of just sink into your skin but yeah at a point you're like what's going on hmm I anybody ever had experience of having to show someone how to tell the time on a watch when they've been asked what time it is? When was well, the yeah. last time someone was asked what time it was randomly? It happens to me a lot, ironically. I was just asked what time it was the other day, uh, and I, I got to consult my watch and, and happily tell the person that it was 10 till 4. But Rick's right. There was like a decade where no one asked that question, but then it made a comeback. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it made a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was once asked if I knew what the time was while I was standing underneath Big Ben. I'm like, guys, look behind you. One of the most famous clocks in the world. It is telling the right time. You don't need to know it off my but iPhone. A lot of times that could be, be an sure opener to show me your watch and I see if it's worth stealing. So we're we're understandably suspicious <laughs> about engaging with the public on this. I, I was standing beside two very burly security guards in the queue to get into a parliamentary reception at the time. It was all a bit weird. But there <laughs> we go. I, this or the previous uh, Urwork watch, Kevin? Oh, this 100%. This Hublot ticks all the boxes for me. Um, I'm interested Quote, in that. Kevin, before. this Hublot oh. ticks all the boxes for me. <laughs> oh, it's a, a good ad right there, you know, a little I'm quote, a testimonial there. Yeah. 
I do like some of the <laughs> some of the works they do. Some of the watches they have come out with. When you go back to the classic, was was for me is a great watch, very understated. Um, but this is if that's at one end, and now this is a you know the other end of the spectrum of what they produced. Um, it is amazing. What is that material called? Thank you. It's not a carbon. It's a Texalium. I mean, it is a carbon, but I think it's a trade name. Yeah. Yeah, So it's like carbon (laughs) fiber, but with like a really tight, sexy weave. It's all about the texture. Let's, it's not about the performance. It's just, Hey, this looks cool. It does look cool. Let's see. Tell me how much it costs. (laughs) Uh, Chuck in the chat and bear in mind, you can join us on a Tuesday morning, UK time when we record this. Uh, for all the live, you then get the preamble and the post-match. Uh, so Chuck is suggesting that his point has just been proved in that if you hang around long enough, uh, everything from an independent wash brand eventually becomes in, becomes in Hublot. Uh, there we go. Right. So let's go from that to this. This is Ariel Adams from A Blog to Watch with a message from Zodiac Swiss Made Watches. Did you know that the historic Zodiac brand just released an in-house GMT mechanical movement? Through their in-group partner STP, that stands for Swiss Technology Production, Zodiac recently introduced an upgraded Super Seawolf GMT watch with their new Caliber STP 7-20 automatic movement. Built in Switzerland, the modern STP 7-20 automatic movement features the local time, a second time zone displayed via a 24-hour GMT hand, and the date. Special features include the use of a silicon escapement for increased performance and environmental resistance. The bold and architectural styling of the Super Seawolf GMT product itself harkens back to Zodiac's history during the 1950s and 1960s as a premier manufacturer of sports activity and professional use wristwatches. Updated for modern expectations, featuring world-class performance and durability, the latest Super Seawolf GMT watches come in a few styles and has a 40 millimeter wide steel case. One of the most popular new Super Seawolf GMT automatic watches for 2024 has a stunning pink and white two-tone bezel matched to a legible black dial. Don't miss the iconic rotating bezel design, interchangeable straps, and strong value proposition Zodiac offers for a watch with this feature set. Zodiac Super Seawolf GMT watches start at just under $2,000. To see them for yourself, visit the Zodiac website at ZodiacWatches.com. Uh, just because it seems like we're just going to review three very expensive watches that are all kind of just as crazy as each other. Then we can decide which one was our favourite. This, the Roger Dubuis Orbis in Machina watch with central flying tourbillon, because who doesn't want a central flying tourbillon? Uh, David reviewed this. Unfortunately, he's not here. I, Ariel, have you seen this watch? Yeah. Live in the flesh. Yeah, I saw and it. What what were your thoughts? It's uh, it's skeletonized, so you get that whole wrist hair effect through the watch, which always seems to be kind of like, yeah, we spent hundreds of thousands of pounds making your watch see through, and then what you see is the back of your wrist. It, it doesn't sound like as much of an achievement when you kind of put it that way, but is it distracting? Um. It's a very common thing in pictures where you look at these watches where, as you said, you can see through to the back. If it's not your wrist, you're immediately offended. If it is, you're just like, oh, okay. Um, (laughs) This one, you don't see a lot of it, okay? It's only that little sort of narrow ring around the periphery where you see it. It's not like some others where there's just like arm hair, arm hair, arm hair. So um, I'd say that that's not really an issue here at all. this is more uh, uh, an interesting advancement of their, you know, they're, they're the focus on tourbillons. It's all about the double tourbillon. You know, they, they call their single tourbillon watches literally mono tourbillon, like just to distinguish like, oh, we have some with more of these. Um, you couldn't have a symmetrical thing like this with tourbillon, two tourbillons unless you wanted to stack them and have one on the front and one on the back. Hey, that's something no one's done before. Um, so I, I think that's interesting because for so many years, Roger Dubuis <clears throat> was selling watches <clears throat> like all the other ones with an eccentric off-center tourbillon. <clears throat> if you want a symmetrical dial, you just you couldn't really do it. So for there's a novelty, I think, in-house to have a centered tourbillon. 
this was a hard thing to do for many years. I remember Omega was one of the few companies that had a central tourbillon. And when you spoke to watchmakers, you can, you can see it's just, it's hard to do. Uh, in this case, the watch has to be so thick that the hands are either have to be stacked underneath it um, or on the sides of it. And you see here that there are traditional hands, but they're not shaped straight. They have this interesting geometry that allows them to sort of go to the sides of it. So there's a lot of interesting micro-engineering that had to go here. It is true that Roger de Bouy is a bit late to the party of the this, this central tourbillon, but I, they may have the only one which has the Geneva Seal certification. Um, so this is novel for the brand and for their you know, their cohort of, of tourbillon collectors that this offers something new. In the world of horology, are they pushing new boundaries? Uh, not so much, uh, but the world of central tourbillons is still, at least compared to other ones, a bit niche. And when you see the tourbillon in the center, it, it is pretty cool as opposed to being just a little bit lower or a bit to the side or whatever. But again, you're, you're, you're talking about slight differences of flavors of watches that all cost, you know, well over 100. This is over 200,000. Um, so I hope that's an explanation. Is this the Knights of the Round Table watch without either the Knights or the Round Table? Sort of. <laughs> There'll I'm be more of that at, coming too. Well, I'm looking at the structure of it, and it it, it kind of looks a lot like like that kind of mechanism, but without but without the wee little knights or the thing, and the, the, they've kind of replaced. You it. could tell that they wanted the center to actually be a spinning round table, like you know that's coming. Didn't didn't they do a Knights of the Round Table mono tourbillon? It was like five hundred and eight. Yeah, we wrote about. it. I just looked it up. Here we go. Yeah, five hundred eighty thousand. This looks like David's wrist, or at least his shirt, uh, from <laughs> from yeah two thousand twenty three. So yeah, last year. This yeah, this looks this yeah without the table or the knights. But I think for those who weren't looking for a Knights of the Round Table, but like the concept of this piece, I do feel like this is a bit more approachable as a timepiece. <laughs> the the world's smallest demographic of consumers. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the Knights of the Round Table. I just didn't want the Knights of the Round Table. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do feel there's a guess. Are you familiar with the game Guess Who? Is Does it involve American guessing game? who? Yeah, it does, but I, I feel like you have this row of people and you have to guess who it is for your opponent's shows. I feel there's a game to be played that way with watch journalist wrists. I wonder if we lined up the photographs of bare wrists from several journalists, whether we could tell who it was, just because it ingrained into the back of her head is the vein pattern or how hairy the arm is, etc. Et so for all so five of you that want to play that game in the world, Rick is going to be your host. <laughs> I'll be the hostess for the weirdest game <laughs> ever played. You think you think Roger Debris niche? Just you wait. Uh, our new game show appears. Uh, Will you have returned? I think from Potato Internet Land. Uh, what do you think of this? Can you hear us? Okay. Yes. Yes, Will is back. Uh, I can hear you. Okay, as long as you yes, can hear can. me. Yeah. Um. Uh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I I I really like the watch. Um, the only thing is that large uh, round watches like that kind of reminded me a little bit of. Um, uh, is it Jacob and Co. who've got the um, uh, roulette uh, roulette uh, machine um, on a watch? It's one of them. Um, and um, yeah, it's one of them. Uh, and I just kind of maybe I expect too much from my from my watches, but I just wanted it just to be spinning around um, randomly um, as I wished. So, yeah, um, but it's, you know, it, have you seen yeah, the HYT see tourbillons? If you want randomly moving things around in the center, they have you covered, sir. Is that because they've forgotten to connect them to anything? No, no, no. They're, they're all connected. But I asked them, I'm like, does this planetarium track anything? They're like, no, it just looks cool. Oh really? <laughs> oh yeah. Same thing for the Jacob and Company Astronomia. So Jacob and Company HYT both have I just call them spinny twirly things. So is there any circumstance under which that would cause a problem that you are you know those two astronauts that are stuck in space? We sure hope they're not like using February. that to track the planetary body movement. I was gonna that say, would be bad, is yeah. there is there a possibility that you know what I need? I'll take one of these watches because then I know everything and then it results in sure and certain death because your tracking of the planets was wrong. Write, write that story and see if that plot passes muster with audiences, okay? Maybe maybe you write a false you write a false horoscope, it all goes horribly wrong. It was based on the Jacob and Co. 
random spinning thing? Saturn wasn't actually there. Nobody who has a watch that actually has a functioning planetarium in it is at, is going to set that when they want to wear it. So just having it be like planets anachronistically moving through space is pretty much ideal. You just set the time and you go about your day and it's, you still get the effect of a bunch of stuff floating around on your watch, but you don't ever have to look at what position Mercury or Saturn is in when you're just trying to get out of the door in the morning. It kind of makes a lot of sense, a non-functioning planetarium. I think Christian Vanderkorn needs to come up with a kind of marketing plan that his is so accurate, it allows you to do something. So we need to, you know, to buy the Christian Vanderkorn planetarium rather than these other ones, because if you get into this certain circumstance, this is going to rescue you. You know, if you can't see the North Star, but you can see Jupiter ascending, you'll know where you are in the world. It's like an alternate to the Breitling emergency. By the way, an April Fool's idea is slowly forming in this, okay? We don't have an idea yet for next time, and these things take a while to plan out. Omega would get defensive about the moon, though, if it made an appearance on the planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> How much would Omega going. pay to put their logo on the actual yeah. moon is my question. Hey, has somebody not tried that as an April Fool once before? Or no, actually, it, is there not a company that was set up? to try and shine advertising onto the moon? Or am I just imagining a Batman film plot somehow? Sounds about I think, right. I feel like that I would absolutely so ruin an airline flying through that path. <laughs> <laughs> Some, so, somebody who's somebody who's can mute themselves. Can you just Google advertising on the moon? I'm sure someone came up with a mad but, scheme. You're, you're just going to get served the Omega ads. Is... There's no point to looking that up. You're just <laughs> going to get served <laughs> Omega ads. Yeah. But you know those like... You know those like laser adverts yeah. that you used to get, whereby they would kind of fire really quickly and track, like a like a sparkler. What? I'm sure it was that was the concept <laughs> that they'd fire a laser at the moon really quickly. And so when people are draw... shooting lasers at Rick, it's not offensive. <laughs> it's just send him advertising. <laughs> send me advertising. Yeah, like Omega symbol on the moon. I, I'm sure if nobody's come up with that, then I've just come up with it. So if somebody wants to send me a I, laser, I think the FAA will be in immediate contact with you. Like you, you can't just like shine lasers up into the the ether. Like that's that's how American centric of you, Ripley. Who says it's going to be based in the states? Well, I want to the shine FAA lasers too, nothing. Rick. Do I have it to will, come to Scotland? And- <laughs> It will be based in Scotland. It will be under what we call here Scots Law, which basically allows us to get away with anything that nobody else likes us doing. Uh, will will tell you all about that. Will spent all oh, of yeah. these years yeah. learning about the law to practicing it, only to discover that he can't come north of the border because he doesn't have the right piece of paper. Because Will doesn't operate under Scots Law because he's not Scottish. So there you go. So yeah, a Scots Law laser. That is very. It's Paris. very true. Uh-huh. it's very true it's a frustration is that i can't go north of the border but it does mean that as rick says what happens north of the border stays north of the border and they can do what they wish so it sounds like you live in south korea <laughs> <laughs> yeah strangely enough some people do draw some similarities between the scottish government and the North Koreans, but that's uh, for another day uh azad has joined us good morning azad how are you Good morning. Very well, thank you. You're very much in London by the looks of it. Is that London in the background? No, yeah, still in London. It is. Yeah. Good, good, good. I mean, he's not in London. He's in like Devon somewhere. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> London in the background for this morning. Well, let's uh, move on and we'll play some hit miss maybe. So uh, first of all, where is every? body ripley what are you wearing what are you i mean when we say what you're wearing we really mean from your head to your toes as well as your wrist and where are you um well we'll just go ahead to my waist because that's kind of where the clothing <laughs> stops today uh but we've got ublo uh world cup uh qatar on the hat brightling on the shirt and then i am wearing the papar a neo gmt it's like a sector dial but functional sector dial so the gmt's in there um Stumbled across this brand uh, and then found out that the guy who started it went to my college. So that was an interesting, uh, an interesting small world instance. Is this in for review yes. or just for your delectation? No, no, so. this is just in for review. Uh, I'm going to, there's only a few prototypes, so I'll photograph it and send it back and get to it at some point. But it is an interesting watch, quite a bizarre case shape, but um, very interesting. 
I also hear that you received a, a watch. Now he's not here, so let's talk about him. So uh, yeah, let's just sneak out the watch. The D trash has finally arrived. Oh yes, oh yes, the D trash has landed. While while he's not here, you know, give it a quick hit miss. Maybe what do you think? Okay, so he was saying this, and he it went before he sent it. He's like, you know what? A lot of people <laughs> tell me like. I don't know if this is my baby because I don't have good images or something, but like everyone who gets this sees one of them is like, actually, it's a lot better in person than I thought it would be. And I was like, well, come on, your photo photos. It's are- like all of us. We're, we're a lot better in person than everybody thought that we would be. No, this is the best you get. It all just goes downhill in person <laughs> here. Rick, the first thing you said to me, I think, when I met you in person was like, oh, I'm surprised you're not taller. I'm like, oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> I didn't see that. Yes, you did. We were in that vegan restaurant in Geneva. That was uh that was exactly what you said. Oh, to so me. we were. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I don't for people don't forget, right, Mister Bond? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's but it actually is a lot better in person than I I thought it would be. I it, it, it's quite cool actually. I think it's the quote for the back of the bus for the bus stops. It's just a lot better in person than we thought it would be. With Ripley holding it up, who's also a lot better in person than we thought he would be. Cool. Anyway, that's D-Trash. We'll, we'll maybe uh, bravely review that when Guy's actually on the show. Kevin, good morning. Where are you? What are you wearing? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm in Germany, a little place called Bremen. It's not so little, uh, which is the north of Germany. Uh, You're in a place called Bremen? He's <laughs> <laughs> coming back to Bremen. No. <laughs> no, way back to Bremen. No. Bremen. Bremen. No. Nah. Bremen. Bremen. You've got me going now. Bremen, which is south of Hamburg, south of, about 50 miles south of Hamburg. Nice, nice. That would have been a what? better story than crashing in a field, to be fair. What? But, um, you know, it was actually named after a town in Germany. Yeah, but then it would have to be a German brand and name. And the boys wouldn't do that, would they? Definitely not. The, the, the crashing in the field is a much better story, 100%. But, fair uh, enough. At, and at what are you moment, wearing? I'm wearing the Grand Seiko Skyquake. You can see it. Hold on. There we go. Very good. Very nice. cool. Not sure your potato internet today from a hotel in Germany as uh, as we know German internet from Rob can be a bit shaky, which is a bit strange. So it is a Grand Seiko. We can't tell from the blurry images as to what it is inspired by. It would be anything, but it's like Mount, oh, it's... Mount Iwati on a foggy day. That's what it's inspired uh, by. In the I, don't, I don't think it's a foggy day. I think it was just a bright summer's day, but definitely Mount Iwati, <laughs> looking outside, getting inspiration. I think, yeah, it's blue is this, this particular blue. So, yeah, it's beautiful. Though. Excellent. So, like, this might just be grand... an excuse for Grand Seiko designers to spend hours sipping tea and just staring out the window aimlessly. Uh, yeah, just <laughs> oh, like, what are you doing? I'm looking for inspiration. <laughs> don't. Well, hmm. well, not, I've absolutely. Don't my. Never thought I'm waiting before. for the seasons <laughs> to change. By winter, we might have a new, uh, a new, a new concept for you guys. <laughs> it t- like Grand Seiko is full of work shy watchmakers. Is that what we're saying? No, no, no. no I just think not. like everything's inspired by nature, and some of these places are set in very beautiful surroundings. And if I worked there, I'd probably want to look out the window a lot too. Mm. I can only imagine the kind of watch designs we would come up with in Scotland if you had to be inspired by what you saw out the window. <laughs> just <laughs> it's impossible to actually. It would be Ooh, drug we, users? we would have been which was all would, which is what all prison fiction styles. also boils down to what you're able to see out of your cell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, hands off my country. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Ariel, where are you? What are you wearing? I am in Geneva. I arrived here last night. I will be here for about a week. Uh, as I guess this is Geneva Watch Days. Um, I'm <laughs> once a Geneva Watch Week, but y- yeah, <laughs> IP been uh, I'm wearing again the uh, the Laco Hamburg Din 8330, and I have to update my discussion of this watch a little bit. I was so naive to believe the information that they sent out to people that this was a <laughs> friendly collaboration between Laco and Zin, and I realized it didn't begin so friendly. It ended up friendly, uh, where right, okay. Laco may have. Um, uh, emulated some of the things that Zinn <laughs> felt that that was proprietary, and there was a bit of a bit of a kerfuffle that all ended out ended up well. So I think that every one of these watches that Laco sells, Zinn makes a little bit of money, so money. everybody wins. Right, okay. um, everybody wins. But, but this is a really great travel watch. Um, I I really like traditional style pilot watches for their legibility. They kind of fit in a lot. So as a travel watch, I like it. Um, not the most, you know, it's 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 not glamorous, but it doesn't need to be. It's just tool watch so that kind of story that there's like a weird 
thing between these two German companies and that it has this really great certification. Now I like it even more because it's a conflict watch. <laughs> conflict watch. Will, our chief, our flip-flopper-in-chief has returned. All hail, Will. He has returned with potato internet, but he is back. I know. Thank you. Uh, where are you, and what are you wearing? I need to. I need to go and crank the internet again. <laughs> I think this is some, something I need to run. Work up somewhere. powered internet. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, so I'm in uh, Poland, uh, just outside of Warsaw. Um, which sounds, whenever I say that, sounds like I'm on military maneuvers <laughs> or something like that. I'm based just outside of Wa- okay. just outside of Warsaw in a location I can't disclose to you now. Lack of German all, accent. All will become okay. clear. Yes. Exactly. So <laughs> what are you wearing on your wrist? I am uh, wearing my uh, Seiko Prospect Paddy uh, Pepsi um, uh, SKX. I don't know if it's an SKX. I don't think it is, actually. I think it's an SPRA21K1. Um, anyway, it's a chunky diver, which I absolutely love, which has just been – had received such punishment and continues to keep very good time. So, um, yeah, it's a good travel good. companion. Excellent. Well, Breaking News Beats, who's a regular on the chat uh, on the show, has just said that he wishes that the Grand Seiko designers would take some hallucinogens, get into the woods and come up with whatever they get inspired by there. It sounds like a a, a developing strategy. Uh, Azad, where are you and what are you wearing? Uh, I am in uh, London and I am wearing the Vertex M100 AC. Very nice. Oh, Vertex. I do like a Vertex. Yeah. Very clean, very clean. Right, well, let's see if you like these. Oh, I'm in Scotland. It's raining. I'm wearing a Panerai. It's really the only watch to wear it in this particular weather. Uh, Right, I'm not sure how well this would go down in Scottish weather. I'm not sure how well it will go down with all of us. Ripley, how well did it go down with you? The Tag Heuer Connected Caliber E4 45mm Times Oracle Red Bull Racing Edition Smartwatch. At what point do Tag, Stroke, Ublo decide that there's only room for one of them within LVMH group for smart connecting? No, watches? there's two different and types of rich dudes. Two different types of rich dudes. The uh, right, okay. They're, they're, you know, there's a smattering of rich dudes who shop the end uh, the LVMH brand. So this plays to a different market. It's like half the price of one of the Ublos. Uh, while the Ublos will give you all the teams, this is just for uh, Red Bull and F1. Um, but I think what's sort of interesting here is, yeah, there's some features that are sort of tailored to the race uh, where, you know, the race calendar kind of you've got flags that progress throughout it. These are all virtual faces, let you know how the drivers are doing and whatnot. Um but what I think is kind of a more interesting thing is this is only for Red Bull tags, a sponsor of Red Bull. But if the rumors are true that, as Rolex's contract ends for next year, LVMH, uh, particularly TAG, would take their position. I could totally see this coming out in a non-Red Bull, like just standard F1 format and have it be sort of like how the Ublo has the watches that are basically luxury spectator accessories for these super fans of the sports or teams. Um, so this is just for Red Bull. I'm sure they'll sell a handful of them to the Red Bull super fans, and I'm sure we'll see these on the wrists of... Uh, various you know crew members and whatnot in the pit but um i think this is just sort of them edging towards what very well may show up next year uh to commemorate the title sponsor as the timekeeper of f1 other than that it's just a 45 millimeter titanium tag connected watch it's basically the same one we've got before you know with the red bull strap hey right let's vote on it Hit, miss, or maybe. Hit, hit, miss, miss. Oh, I can't actually tell from Will's uh, potato internet how he's voting. He's voting <laughs> Neither smudge. can I. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Oh, that does and say maybe. As adds a hit. It does <laughs> say maybe. Excellent. Uh, right. The... I think this is a hit because of the strap. The strap looks cool. I couldn't care less about the watch. I've got an Apple Watch. If I want a connected watch, I'll actually use uh, a watch that connects to things rather than its, its own wee, wee niche. Uh, Ripley, how'd you vote? I said it's a miss. Uh, Red Bull's not my team. And if I am going to root for one of the Red Bull teams, I'd love to root for their uh, B Squad, which uh, formerly, well, formerly 
Oh God. I mean, they've been through a lot of things, but, but now they're that V carb one who have the tutor, but yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I just don't root for Red Bull. I think it's a little bit too narrow of a scope. I like the concept of it, but the fact that it's so specifically tailored to F1 fans that are also Red Bull fans exclusively Red Bull fans. It's sort of like a one foot in one foot out. I like that they're doing it, but this is just a kind of a half-baked a- execution because you can't swap the face to Mercedes because, oh, IWC is the sponsor of Mercedes. And you can't go to McLaren because Richard Mills got McLaren. Well, what about Ferrari? Richard, they've, and Richard Mills also got Ferrari. Well, how about Alpine? Nope, sorry, that's Moser. Uh, Aston Martin, well, that's going to be Gerard Perigo. So then it's like, well, maybe Williams. So I understand why it's not happening right now, but um, making a team agnostic version, I think, would just be uh, a, a better overall time piece. Kevin, how'd you vote? I voted a miss. Um, basically, I agree with you, Rick, that the strap is the best thing, but hence, you, but it's a what? So you don't vote for the strap, do you? I don't know. But um, I mean, I think. I Guy's just not that, here, so I have to do, I have to do the strap biggest, assessment. Yeah, the strap is the best thing. I can't see the the watch being a hit anywhere. I mean, Rick says it's just for you know Red Bull people in the in the pits pit lanes. It's just it's a nonsense for me if you ask me. It's got oh, a not in the pit lanes. Reserve. It's for oh, Red Bull on. fans on their couch. I'm sure we'll see them on the guys in the pits for promotional purposes. But no, no, no. This no, yes. not on the couch. The guy on his yacht or something. You know, something more oh, grand. Okay. But yeah. This is literally like the rich guy spectator accessory. Do you suppose that the pit lane wearers of this watch change the watch faster when they leave the day's racing than they manage to change the car tires on the one hundred percent themselves? One hundred percent, which happens faster. They are just gutted. They don't get a Monaco like the drivers. Like if I was. I like I'd be so like Mercedes. They all get those performance chronos. It's basically a like a matte pilot with the team colors on it Whoa. super cool watch uh i would much rather have that iwc than like hey you're a crew member on uh, red bull here's your 45 mil connected watch be like oh man maybe i will take that mercedes contract oh come on this just, just looks so wrong I mean, uh, oh, this this is actually start. the coolest face, the one with the flags, because it progresses throughout the calendar. So at least you can see where you're at in the season. That's the only thing that's not like really Red Bull specific. Mm. Oh, Ariel, yeah. how'd you vote? My, I voted a hit um, for I think slightly different reasons. Um, this may not be ultimately the tag lawyer connected for me. But I do like that tag lawyer is maybe one of the only companies that's quite pushing ahead with what a luxury smartwatch is supposed to be they've invested in software developers you can see that they're trying to push the forms they're trying to make interesting types of collaborations um arguably this makes a little bit more sense than Ublo's, you know watch for soccer referees uh in terms of you know uh the the marketing um i think red bull is a very interesting company you can't deny the proliferation and the amount of people that um they have hired or that are fans of their various activities so in terms of my interest in the luxury watch, smartwatch segment moving forward, um, that is really what Tagler is trying to do, and I celebrate it for that. If you are interested in smartwatches and want one with the Wear OS, you know Google's operating system, this is probably the best, if not only high end one out there. You can get like you know uh, Google or a smartwatch, which is not particularly attractive, um, or you can get something like this, which just is going to give you a much better experience. So. If you're trying to judge this in the vacuum against mechanical watches, it's a bit of an awkward thing. But for sort of the important burgeoning industry of luxury smartwatches, um, you know, really Tag Heuer is sort of holding the baton. And so I have to celebrate them for that. Well, Sis, just one quick point on that. You say it's run by Google, of course. It's got the operating system. Google are infamous for dropping stuff. You know, two years down the line, that software will they say, we're not going to update the software anymore. And that watch is going to be redundant. Well, well, who do you trust more to update the software, Google or Tag Heuer? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither. Uh, That's a fair comment. Hey, does this not look remarkably like a Tudor logo on the back of this tag? Uh, that's, well, they're I both shields. Where I think, yeah, they're, 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 <laughs> they're both shields, shields. But, but it's not because it's not filled in with the Tag Heuer colors. I see this and I think... Tudor before I think Tag. But anyway, there we go. Uh, moot point. Uh, Azad, how'd you vote? 
Uh, I voted for a hit. I think uh, it's nice to see some real customization and application development being put forward for uh, a theme or, well, in this case, obviously for F1. Um, I think that's exactly where smart watches should be uh, heading in in general. You know, the highest end watches out there are some of the upper end Apple watches. Uh, um, Samsung have just pretty much copied the high end ultra watch uh, from from Apple as well in the, in terms of its looks, but but those are kind of retailing at about what six hundred pounds ish in, in in the UK without any kind of contract. And if you get one, obviously you can get it for cheaper. Obviously for tag they're, they're pushing the boat out a bit more and they, and they are really well made from what i've seen of the past ones and that, that strap does look uh, quite nice so I, I think it's a hit for me although i you know i'll acknowledge it's it's very limited for the number of people that are going to buy it but i think if you fall in that pool of people i think you're going to really like this um and i don't really think was it about two thousand dollars two thousand pounds this is resentful i don't think that's particularly high frankly for a for a millionaire on a yacht. Um, I, I can think of some more, much more expensive watches they'd be going for. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Will, a question has been asked in the chat. Uh, you're in an undisclosed location somewhere in Poland wearing a Seiko diver. Are you actually in special ops? Are you a special ops lawyer? Is that really what you do? Um, I think... Uh, sorry, my internet's so bad. I didn't hear any of that, but I presume you're asking my opinion <laughs> on the watch. Um, uh, it's, sorry. Excellent Absolutely. way to dodge uh, the question. Fantastic. I, do, <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. You'll it's need to job. watch the replay of this, Will. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so in flip-flop style, I said maybe... But do I go for a hit? The, I, I don't know. I, I said maybe because I think it does quite a few things very well. It's very good as a marketing tool. I think the, um, uh, the luxury smartwatch or the smartwatch market is evolving very quickly. And there are still lots of people who will change their smartwatch. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not talking about millionaires on yachts, but uh, perhaps – they're going to be outdated every four, a bit like a mobile phone, maybe every four or five years, the technology will have a big jump and people will update it. So this will capture those people. Of course, it's going to be for Red Bull fans, perhaps, but um, uh, I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think it, I think it does those things, those things quite well. The only thing I'm disappointed about is the one, I think it's got a one day battery on it, which so cool. is, um, which is disappointing considering I thought the technology could move on further to at least give us. Well, two and it's three, forty-five mil. Days. You can't put a bigger um, chargeable but, battery in there. Exactly. I'm not sure what's taking up all of the space. To be honest with you, I'm not. I'm not a technical expert, but it doesn't seem like the size. I mean, obviously, Apple has grown its Ultra Watch, and and I, I suspect a lot of that is just to make it look big and chunky. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. I think it, it should have a better battery. I can see the market, and I do like the strap. As well, it reminds me a bit of the Panerai um, Luna so, Rossa yeah. uh, one as well. Uh, Another there, watch, but, which is um, only interesting because yeah, so I the said strap. maybe, but you know, <laughs> 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 I don't know. I like I, I've got a soft spot. For, I've got a soft spot for, for that one. Um, but um, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So I said, I said, I said maybe, but perhaps it's a hit. I, I, I flip flop, so yeah, 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 we'll call it a hit stuff. then. Right, back to your spying. Uh, okay, next. Oh, up i would go from one tag to another tag hoyer monaco split seconds chronograph watch apparently the brand's new face of ultra luxury but what do we think about the watch ariel did you you got hands on with this yeah so this sort of is meant to extend the legacy of high-end tag hoyers there's been a lot of them over the last 25 uh, 20 years or so um this is the latest one that is a movement that was created um, by um, uh, Carol Fostier uh, Kasapi, who is uh, essentially their, their, their movement uh, queen now. Uh, she moved over from Richemont to LVMH, um, and she is a really great asset. Um, so it was really great for them to say, let's return to high-end movements and see what we could do. She took the concept of a split second chronograph and tried to make it a little bit more interesting. Tag Heuer worked with Vaucher 
to essentially do everything on the manufacturer side. So that's actually kind of cool. They didn't have to build anything. They just designed it. And they're like, you guys build the case. You guys build the movement and all that. There's two versions of this. There's one that I wrote about and one that David also wrote about. Um, and they're just, you know, slightly cosmetically different. They're both, you know, titanium. This is not a universally loved watch. There's some awkward elements here. I would not necessarily have, have um, positioned this way, but I think they were trying to go for sort of a futuristic tool watch, which is also sort of like pulled in the past. And I think that, that you can see the inherent struggle there, right? Because in some way, you can't necessarily have something which is in the past, but also in the future. Once in a while, it works, but you see them trying to make this a somewhat traditional watch by also making it a futuristic watch. And I think we'll all agree there's some cohesive issues there. Like the Monaco is supposed to be retro, as is a mechanical split-second chronograph. But you're trying to get a little bit futuristic with the case design and the dial and things like that. So um, there are a lot of interesting things here. It is a cool watch to wear. It's definitely a nice conversation piece. Um, but in terms of it advancing hauteur lingerie or giving us something deeply intellectual to talk about, uh, maybe next year. Carol is working on a lot of things there, so I have a lot of faith in her um, and the team to do stuff like that. Um, these are, you know, uh, re relatively limited. They're 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 quite uh, expensive, um, but I definitely think that this is a little bit of a weirder watch. And like other high end tags, um, it's going to have, you know, a, a a bit of a a a mixed opinion when it comes to the conversation about it. Okay, cookie. Count to three. Is it a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three, go. Miss, hit, hit, maybes. And we'll guess that Will is saying it's a hit. Good, good. Uh, right, uh, Ripley, how'd you vote? I said it's a hit. Um, This is basically the commercially available version of their only watch piece. Um, So if you were squeezed out of the budget for that, piece unique you can get your hands on the standard split second chrono uh, but i think they're really cool like ariel said there's definitely some design cohesion issues uh those sub dials just kind of look like postage stamps thrown on to this otherwise you know very technical looking thing um the, like you said the boxing case but then you look over at the sides but i weirdly like it uh it's kind of a train wreck but kind of a very interesting looking train wreck but uh, yeah i i do like it and i think it's cool for tag to keep doing this type of stuff so they don't just get cornered into the realm of like the entry level luxury brand, get your first paycheck and go get your aqua racer. But like, you know, no one really, but people immediately graduate that to, from tag to other brands. I think it's important for them to kind of have a, a broader catalog. And while the Monaco already is positioned as a, more of a premium piece, you kind of need these halo offerings that just stand out. They're wild. They're crazy. I love how the case backs just like, this huge, just faceted sapphire crystal. And it, it is different. You know, the Monaco, so many of the Monacos just sort of feel like subtle iterations of the same thing. This is remarkably different. Obviously, there is zero value proposition to be had here. It's breathtakingly expensive for a tag. But at the same time, I also think it's really cool. And there's just a lot of things to kind of look at, even if it's not 100% great. So I think it's a kind of, it's a really interesting watch. And I like the blue version here better than the uh, the previous execution. Hmm. Kevin, is there enough worth looking at here to make you vote a hit? How'd you vote? Uh, I voted a hit. Um, it is a bit of a bit of a car crash in, in on the design at some point. So we've had a train you know, crash and a car crash. <laughs> Any advance aircraft crash? <laughs> aircraft crash. Yeah. What? Well, there will be aircraft crashes if you have your laser going out from Scotland. It's another <laughs> shooting them down. Yeah, shooting them down. It's 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 it is lovely. I do like I do like the exposed dial, the way it's opened up. Obviously, it's it is expensive. Would I buy one? No. But there's going to be a few people out there who will who will really purchase in this watch. It is stunning in places. I think everything's come together all the bad bits and the good bits, and it's made it something special. I mean, I love that side profile it, it, with the polish yeah, and normally the Normally bad bits and good bits coming together make something distinctly average, but fair enough. <laughs> not in uh, this instance, I can assure you. Not in this instance. It is, it is lovely, lovely. Good stuff. Remember, you can play along on the YouTube channel, uh, a blog to watch weekly live, 
uh, if you wish. You can also contact us. I do have some jingles, but I can't be bothered setting them up to play. The internet's already not working enough <laughs> for me not to try and play music over it. But if you want to get in touch with the show on WhatsApp, it's plus four four seven three eight six six ninety eight nine seven or email the show podcast at a blog to watch dot com. Ariel How'd you vote at the end, having reviewed it hands on? I voted maybe <clears throat> simply because, you know, there's a lot of competition in this space. Um, and this isn't necessarily my specific interest. The split second chronograph has its fans out there. There are the Rotrapont, you know, nerds out there that like this type of thing. Um, I, I find it fun. I, pre I respect how complicated it is to assemble. And I like a lot of what they did here. Um, but it doesn't meet my particular aesthetic. Um, and the dial isn't necessarily one that I'd want to look at all the time. I think, as other people have said, the back of the watch, where they took the sapphire crystal and they cut an interesting way to make it the case back, is by far the most interesting segment to me. And um, I haven't quite figured out how to wear watches, um, you know, like upside down yet. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Though there are some watches that allow you to do that. Very rare. Um, so I think that they're onto something here, and I really respect that they're doing it. I'm, I'm sure that they'll sell out of it. Um, but, you know, I, don't, I didn't want it to be a hit right away. You know, working with Carol is still relatively new for them. They're still exploring this area. Um, let's see them make incremental improvements so that the, the next time or the one after that, we're like, wow, they've really come a far away. I think that's actually going to be more impressive than if all of a sudden they just, you know, hit one out of the, uh, out of the park and just have a home run that everyone, everyone loves. So, again, they'll do well with this one. Um, but for sort of like our <laughs> our elite nerdery, um, I want to see them take this um, a little bit further, which is hard, which is really hard because politically at the brand, they want to make things desirable. They want to do affordable. They want to do high end. They want to do the past. They want to do the future. Like how you integrate all those competing ideas into one timepiece becomes abundantly difficult. And so politics really gets in the way of those things. We're still not quite sure who's running Tag Heuer right now. Um, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that that all contributes into the sort of like you know uh, ideological or creative vacuum. Um, so we'll we'll wait until that settles a bit. Good, good. Azad, how'd you vote? I voted for it as a hit. Um, I think for me, when we kind of look at the design, um, you sort of think, well, uh, let, let's pretend we were back in the nineteen sixties and seventies, and we had all the technology of you know printing on the sapphire crystal and and doing this kind of work. What would we come up with? It could look something a little bit like like this. Um, I, I still think it kind of retains uh, a lot of the DNA from the original Monaco, but um, the skeletonization, well, the openness of the dial is done really well. It's all very symmetrical, which which a lot of uh, other watches don't achieve. I think it's really good looking. Um, so yeah, hit for me. Cool. Will. <laughs> It was a hit for me. Um, I like the contrast of the modern and the classic design elements. Um, it reminded me a little bit of, um, I suppose, kind of Bang & Olufsen, those um, stripped out design uh, elements where you just have uh, various shapes kind of contrasting with each other. Um, and uh, I liked it. The only thing I wasn't quite sure about was the strap on it i'm not sure if that particularly worked uh but otherwise um i like it as something that's quite unique and again is a conversation piece um mm. as well i gave it a miss because i'm fairly sure this would be completely unwearable <laughs> from my point of view but also the and it was one of the comments in the chat and i'll share the screen is at watches that tell you what they're doing so Ratrapante and Chronograph written right across the <laughs> across the piece. Somebody had commented similarly in the chat about Piaget. Uh, flyback Chronograph. Like, actually, I don't, if I've spent that much money on a watch, I don't want you to tell me what each of the, like, it's like wearing a branded T-shirt. I, I don't need you to make it quite so obvious as to what each thing does i'm not going to get that confused i, I want to add some context examples. here first of uh -huh. all you're absolutely right this is a stupid annoying practice but here's why it happens remember how often people just use a picture of their watch as their ad this is a huge problem in the industry where they don't have a lot of independent advertising collateral 
their watches are their ads. I mean, we talked about this many times on the show, how brands are doing releases instead of marketing campaigns. And so the sad reality is, and this is similarly in the car world, where the item itself has to be an ad. So when see, people see the pictures, they're like, oh, annual calendar, this brand, now I know that they do that. So for the wearer, they lose out. But they're doing this because of how, how many more people will see a picture of this watch as opposed to actually wearing it. Mm, interesting. I particularly like this Parmigiani, uh, whereby it has a date window that says June, and it chooses to write the word month next to it. Just in case you weren't familiar with all the shorthands uh, of the months, because uh, you're writing month and then J U N or D E C, maybe if you were daft enough not to know it was a month, you wouldn't understand that D E C was short for December and you'd need the whole month. It's just daft. The other thing I noticed about this watch was I wasn't entirely sure how well finished it was. I will stop sharing this screen and try and share a close-up uh, for those that are watching along. Uh, yeah, it's so got an industrial the, finishing. It's not. It's not meant yeah. to be a hot or lingerie. It's definitely a lot of brush surfaces out of the machine. Uh, that's what they're going for. But when you're used to like nicely hand polished surfaces, it's it's quite a difference. Yeah, but f for one hundred and thirty four thousand. I'd want more than somebody sticking a blob of red paint on the end of look the hour I, hand. again. As we know, these were these were the prototypes that we shot at Watches and Wonders. Often these are created by hand, so especially when it comes to the hands, they will paint them by hand. And yes, I've told them for years. I'm like, but this is the one that we shoot. So this is a a conflict between how these prototypes are made versus you know media needs. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily judge these. I would look at sort of the, the final ones. But with that said, sometimes that is exactly how the final ones go up. So it's a bit of an unknown, like, will it be better? Um, so I don't know if these have, have, have hit the wild yet in terms of the final ones. But you're right. It would be really good to do like a, a, a macro photography comparison of the coloring of the yeah, hands. Yeah, actually. Yeah, interesting. Right. Well, let's share something wild and crazy before we finish. Corona Swiss. Open Gear Flying Turbium Cycle Watch, a more appropriately named watch. I, yeah. Ripley? Um, you wrote this? Yeah, so you the watch itself, again, not not really new. They've done this before, uh, most notably in an all blue uh, configuration. Like, literally the whole watch is blue. Um, they've also done a non-Turbion version that was all purple that Ariel previously reviewed. Um, so this is just the multicolored version of their flying tourbillon regulator. Um, they just leaned in and said yes to all the colors. So you've got this color changing green uh, hand gear shade plate on the upper part. That blue Geneva stripe section is actually the main plate of the movement visible as that like lower part of the dial. Get an orange ring for the hours, uh, you know, a, a strap in orange green and blue it's there no color has been spared here um but you know it's a lurid and very vibrant take on what is otherwise a already i guess a pretty out there looking watch relatively speaking but um you know i think a flying turbion regulators a pretty enthusiast driven piece to begin with um, but this sort of takes it in a very kind of fanciful and non-serious direction. And of course, it's a limited edition because uh, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't expect this to just be something they'd make for 25 years uninterrupted. Forever. Yes. Uh, Azad is going to have to leave us shortly. So very quickly, Azad, a hit or miss or maybe for you? Uh, it's, it's definitely a miss. I think my five-year-old might have, uh, you know, if you, if you give a five-year-old a coloring page and say, color this in, you get something like that. At uh, least they managed to color between the lines, unlike Tag Heuer, <laughs> to be fair to them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thanks <laughs> for having stuff, me on. Right? Let's see you later. Let's all vote on if this is a hit or miss, or maybe one, two, three, go. Hit, 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 hit. So, uh, so we've chucked out the one guy that didn't like it. So, Ripley, why is it a hit for you? I mean, I like colorful watches. This one has all the colors. Um, but I, I think I, I kind of like the juxtaposition of like a very non-serious looking watch mixed with like a very kind of nerd level 
high horology complications. So it's not just a regular, it's a flying tourbillon regulator. And it looks like something that you colored out of a crayon box. It, it really reminds me of kind of one of those like configurator things where you can just drop on colors and design your own timepiece. <laughs> like this is totally something that late at night, I would have put together and been like, oh yeah, that looks pretty rad for, I want that one. And like, yeah, here it is. They're making it. It's a, it's a production model. So um, I, I, yeah, it's just fun, lighthearted. And I mean, you, you probably don't, I don't care who you are. You don't have one of these in your collection already. No, you certainly don't. Kevin, would you ever add one of these to your collection? No, I would not, but I can understand why somebody would. I mean, I think honestly, Grand Seiko, there was a comment in there was a comment made about somebody going in from Grand Seiko taking L S D and going to the woods. I think that's what Kronos this company's <laughs> designer has done. But it works. For whatever reason, I can't put my finger on it, it works. It's a piece that I would never wear. Um I could, I know don't know anybody who would buy it, but it's still a lovely piece. It's hierology, but it's not taking itself too seriously. So yeah, that's why it's in here. Ariel, how strong is the recreational drug taking to result in a watch like this? Not not very much. This is like the wristwatch of like 1990 ski jackets when it comes to the colors and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> oh, I'm, I had one of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right, actually, like, yeah, yeah you could, yeah, yeah. you could. <laughs> very plainly see yourself and you know out in the wild like this people can spot it from a from a ways you know that's good stuff you know what you have here is them saying what are all the different main colors that you can electroplate to metal and let's play with that you got the sort of the blues the greens the purples that sort of orange that it, it goes kind of to a yellow there's sort of a brown i guess the, that those aren't super attractive but these are sort of the main nice colors that you can achieve through that Chrono Swiss has been validated by doing blue ones and purple ones and things like that. So they've more or less seen that people will buy these things. And I think that's why this is not an LSD watch or something like that, because they've been making stuff substantially similar for a few years. They knew that they could get away with it. I feel that a missed opportunity was on the tourbillon itself. Let's get some crazy colors there. Um, I understand why they couldn't do that. The tolerances are so sensitive. And, and when you change certain things, you add a substrate, um, it can affect it. So unfortunately, the movement didn't receive the same crazy colors. Unclear if that would have been possible or not. But, you know, I can see at least some of those components getting a color treatment. Don't know how that would have affected the, the feasibility of assembling it or the cost. But again, this is already a tourbillon. So those types of things I would, I would expect. Um, so as wild, that, that's what I think is interesting about this. It looks wild, but it's actually not um, that crazy in terms of what they had to do. They didn't have to invent any new processes. Uh, it just goes to show that there's a really healthy appetite um, for these very bold, colorful watches that um, I still think have a few more years of life left in them. Mm. Because of the way this metal coloring is done, will this chip? Mm, no, it could scratch. It, it's it's electroplating, so it's bonded to the surface. But you know, it it is like I said, bonded. So if you have a deep scratch, the surface, of course, will will cut out. Yeah, I, I'm curious to what these humps are on the. That's strap. that's that's a it's based upon the crocodile. So that is um what they call hornback crocodile, and that's a des that's a desirable thing. People like having that little little bump right there. So that's a that's an intended thing. I wonder if it was like these statues that you see on TV whereby they're smuggling stuff inside them. It's a chemical vapor, just a CVD process for the uh, uh, co colorful components. So, yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a plating process. So it's not, maybe, it, maybe it's not the electric well, bath, so it's in a CV, chamber. Yeah, CVD, yeah, that'd be the gas chamber, right? The chemical vapor. Yeah, it's a chamber. They like, yeah, they put it in there and it... Vapor deposit. Yeah. Good, good. Will, does your, do you have all, you're an artist, do you have all these colors as pens somewhere? Or is this? Just... I, I do, I do. I have them all in a palette somewhere. Um, And uh, it's stunning. It just brings the smile to your face. There's so many wonderful colors. It's like the Joker from the Batman movie. Um, Why would, why would you not want the Jack Nicholson um, <laughs> watch? Um. Yeah, it, it's um, it it's wonderful, and I think living in the UK where it's grey and rainy, it's nice to have something uh, colourful. One thing we didn't mention about it, and there's no image that they included with it, but if you go to their website and hunt around one of the banners that goes by, you'll see it. It's um, 
all the little loom blocks, those little cylinders, they're solid blocks of loom, and they're all in different colors. So uh, you get a multicolored display both in the daylight and the night. I have no idea why they would not include a loom shot because that's definitely a cool feature, but they do not. You couldn't even like find the image to save it in a low res format from the website, but that is another cool part. You know, good attention to detail uh, on their side there. No, not that mm -hmm. one. Go down mm -hmm. a bit more. No, down, down yeah, further. Down, We're on the further. website right, now. There you go. There's, see, none of these images. Why don't you send us the, why don't you send us glorious, uh, pretty images? You sent us like four images and I had to take different aspect ratios to put together uh, enough for the article. But yes, if you keep scrolling down, hold up. Yes, oh, here we yeah. go. Yes. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, we like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. It's the Thanos... Uh, Marvel Universe uh, ring. Uh, what, what were those stones called? Infinity Stones. Infinity Stones. Actually, yes. HYT make, already the... makes that watch. All right. Okay. <laughs> so that's why they couldn't use the name. Very good. Oh, did you find what you were looking for? There we go. There, There's a moral and a philosophical question to finish the show on from Chronoswiss asking us on the website when you hang around long enough to get the cookie, didn't you find what you were looking for? I just don't really understand. Should it not be, did you find what you were looking for? I, I don't know. It's a, it's a question for the ages, but uh, I'm going to close that down because we didn't. We're not buying one. Good stuff. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this week. Ariel, you're in Geneva. We may or we may not, depending on the timing, uh, have a show live on the main, a blog to watch channel or somewhere on Thursday evening to go over a, a great big pile of hit miss maybe for the releases on the day of the first day of Geneva watch days. So look out for that. Ariel, anything you're particularly looking forward to seeing? We've obviously got all the embargo details in the background. Is there a brand we should be looking out for from all the embargoed stuff you've seen so far? That's a good question. Um, I'm not going to speak specifically to embargoed stuff, that there are some interesting things. What's interesting to me, and I was talking about this, yesterday with Ripley is all the brand new companies. There's a number of completely new brands, um, more than 10 of them here. Uh, so going to the Beau Rivage Hotel, which is where many of the, the companies are displaying, um, is exciting for me because we'll get to see some some brand new stuff. And some of them will be weird. Some of them will be cool. Many of them will not be here a few years from now. Next year. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, look, the, and we were talking, you know, Ripley was like, well, they're, you know, they're riding on this whole like ind indie brand thing. I'm like, yeah, well, the Swiss, you know, kind of invented the independent watch brand. Um, uh, and they and they've always very skewed high end and they still skew high end. So you have the the luxury micro brands, which are kind of cool to see, as well as the other things that they're trying. So that inventiveness is something that I'm really interested to see. So we'll have to chat about um, that after I, uh, I get to view some of these new watches. Good stuff. Well, thank you all for joining us. If you go to the a Blog to Watch weekly live channel, you can watch the full unedited uh, rec live recording of this show where we will be asking once we log off from this uh, particular podcast, who is Nico? For those that have seen that going on this week. So if you want the answer to that, you need to go to the live uh, recording of this to find out just who is Nico. But other than that, we'll all say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.